And now for something completely different. Watch us on YouTube. Listen on your favourite podcast platform. Or ask your smart speaker to play the podcast Lester Till I Die. Subscribe, like, follow and join in now. Strap yourself in. Because we're set up, switched on and ready to go. On Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This podcast is proud to be part of the Talk Sport Fan Network. Talk Sport. Powered by fans. Right, Chris. All right, good evening. How the devil are you? I hope you can hear me okay. New microphone this week. And let's just say, there's it, a few gremlins. It's a few gremlins. So hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, welcome along, Lester Till I Die. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, thank you very much. On Twitter, we're on all the social networks. Just search Lester Till I Die TV. And if you are listening on your favorite podcast platform, be that Spotify, Google, or Apple iTunes, or many, many others, Thank you very much for lending me your ears. You can have them back later, but I won't be cleaning them for you. This is the conversation, and I'm pleased to say we have got another ex-player. Um, he played for us over 100 times, believe it or not, uh, during sort of the late 80s. Um, had a career, for, a, a small career with England. Best known, I suppose, for his time at Ipswich. And uh, after us, he went on to Southampton. But we're going to be talking to him about, obviously, Leicester, but his whole career as well. And I'm really pleased that and, and thank him for, for joining us. And that's Mr. Russell Osmond. Good evening, Russell. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Chris. How are you doing? Not so bad, thank you. Are you OK? Yep, very good. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? That's the, the question. Afraid so, as some might say. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Remember, I've got the control over the mute button. No problem. No problem. <laughs> as long as you can hear, because because this microphone is is playing up a little bit, I'm still trying to get used to it. But um, yeah, like you said, we you, you you played for Leicester in sort of the late eighties, but you started out your Derby lad, and uh, your dad was a footballer. Yeah, my dad played at uh, Derby County for a few years. Um, I think it was back in the very late 40s, 50s, that sort of time. Um, he used to speak about people like um, Jackie Stamp, the centre forward, and Jackie used to come in my dad's pub and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Rach Carter, one or two of the other um, very well-known ex Derby County players. You know, and I grew up going to the baseball ground, watching games there, uh, if you want me to, I can name you the Derby County side from the early 70s when Les Green was in goal and got John O'Hare, Kevin Hector, Alan Hinton, all those Amazing. sort of guys. Uh, Alan Hinton, you know, wearing white boots, mm. um, which is quite novel at the time then. And, yeah. you know, you used to go and watch games there. And once you got past sort of October, there wasn't much grass on the pitches in those days. <laughs> Now I think the players are a little bit spoiled because they play on perfect pitches, you know, every month of the season. Totally. I mean, I don't know if you, I, I I like to watch um, the ITV4 Big Match Revisited with yeah. Elton Wellesby, who's a good friend of the channel. Uh, it comes on quite a bit. And when you look at some of those pitches, 
and you're thinking, how did players manage to play as well as they did? Because you got the odd flair player, you know, yeah. Georgie Best, we had Keith Weller. And, but some of the pitches, like you say, that you, you, you could have been doing mud wrestling. Yeah, well, I, I watched one of those games probably just over a week ago. Mm. Very muddy, no grass on the pitch, and no. it was wet as well. So you could see all the puddles and everything. Suddenly there was a, a cross-field pass hit in the attacking half that was inch perfect from about 40 yards. The first touch was great. It was then stood back up onto the far post. Somebody came in with a glorious header on the far post and stuck it in the bottom corner. And you thought, in those days, you didn't need a perfect pitch to be able to string three or four perfect passes together. I mean, this is why I always find it difficult when people sort of are trying to compare players from different generations. And obviously, you know... Yeah. You've got, you've got the likes of Pele, which a lot of youngsters obviously never saw him saw him play, and RIP obviously to Pele. But when he was so good on pitches like that, he'd just be amazing now. Yeah, well, obviously I, I had the the pleasure of playing with Pele during the Escape to Victory filming. Um, no, I was going to come on to that one. <laughs> yes, yeah, back in the eighties. But you know, you're talking about Pele, you're talking about people like George Best, Dennis Law, Bobby Charlton. Mm. Uh, people of that uh, caliber and that era, they were fantastic players. People like Tony Curry, Alan Ball, great passes of the ball, Stan Bowles, somebody who ran with the ball exceptionally well. Yeah. You know, and those names just roll off the tongue from from that era. Mm. What was funny? I was talking to Terry Butcher this afternoon. Oh, wow! And you know, somebody came along and sort of joined us for the conversation, and then said. Well, do you think that we could cope with playing in the game in this modern era? And Terry sort of spun it on his head straight away and said, hold on a minute. Do you think the players of today yes. could cope and play in our era yeah. where you were expected to play 90 minutes every game? You're expected to play every Saturday, every Tuesday, every Saturday. You mm. know, they hoped you were stayed fit to play 40-odd games a season, you know, year in, year out. You know, so when you when you turn it around that way... Yeah. It's a different I, argument, isn't it? Oh, it is, totally. And, I mean, when you look at some of the tackles that were going in, I mean, not so long ago, I mean, they always call it the dirtiest game ever, the Leeds-Chelsea, I think it was a cup replay. And that was the one that was on the telly. My God, <laughs> it ended yeah. up like uh, goalkeeper versus goalkeeper these days. With the you can't tackle or touch; it's yeah. no longer in contact. Well, Jack, Jack Charlton flying through the back of players there. And <laughs> yeah. There was one um, when was it? Um, Francis Lee had a punch up with somebody when he was playing for, for Derby County as well. Uh, yeah. Norman Hunter, Francis Lee, oh, Norman God. Hunter, and that went on for ages. That did. Yes, you did make me laugh when you said about uh, Alan Hinton wearing white boots because we've got a player at the moment, Kieran Dewsby Hall, and uh, yeah, I don't think he's got a sponsorship deal with boots yet because he he just wears black boots, and it's so odd to see a player wearing black boots, you know. But uh, nice to see it is. Yes, I mean, like I say, we, we I, well, I grew up with people uh, players wearing black boots, but what was it like having a dad who was a was an ex footballer? I mean, I've I've not coached any sort of level. I was I was sort of a, a, a McDonald stage FA stage one coach for my kids team, which is basically enthusiastic dad stage. That's all it is, you know. Yeah. Um, and it, as a parent, it's so hard to sort of stand on the back and bite your tongue, even if you've never played the game or had anything to do. What was it like? Because obviously your dad would come and watch you. My dad would come and, and watch, yeah. Uh, but my dad was a publican, you know, spent a lot of time doing a lot of hours in the pub. Yeah. Uh, in Repton, the Bull's Head in Repton. Um, but my dad came along to watch the game and support the game. Mm. And that's all he was there for. Very rarely did he um, pass any comment on how we actually played the game. And having had three kids myself all go into the academy system. Uh, yeah. It's difficult. It's mm. very difficult, you know, and I have 
nephews who play the game now and you stand on the touchline with other parents and they look at you sometimes as if I should know what's going on. Mm. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> I haven't got a clue why certain players get picked, why certain players get left out, why your own players don't progress further in the game. Mm. It's 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 difficult. It's difficult being a parent and it's difficult uh, being the son of an ex-player. Um, yeah, it can be a bit of a minefield. I know we had Steve Lanix on uh, last week and uh, he never says sort of who he is when he goes to watch his son. But he said, yeah. I've, been going, I've been going week after week after week. And basically, he said, I could see nothing was happening. And he went up to speak to the coach and said, look, have any of these players ever progressed? And he said, well, no, if I'm honest with you. And he says, well, you know, why do you think that is? And he said, well, who are you? What do you know about football? You know? Yeah. <laughs> it's the only good. time he's ever said to anybody, he just said, go Google me. You know? Yeah. And, uh, Chris, I, I had a situation years ago when one of my kids was in an academy setup and leading goal scorer by Christmas, but yeah. hadn't started a game. So he went to see the academy manager, you know, thought he was doing well enough to, uh, one to start in the side and the academy manager sort of spun on him and said uh, so I son but you've got to learn to fight for a position in this team something your father never had to do in his life <laughs> oh so my said my lad just said to me he said well, yeah but, but what's that got to do with me yes yes you know and what position that is to put a kid in mm. oh, well you know, and if yeah. it ended up that was a grudge that somebody held against me because I kept them out the Ipswich Town youth team sort of 25 years earlier. Oh, my so, God. You know, that's what you have to deal with sometimes. They say revenge is the dish served best served cold, but that was bloody freezing, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a test of my temper, that was. <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine. I suppose the one thing, though, is when you, go to, when you went to your dad and said, like, Dad, I want to be a footballer, he couldn't say no, could he, having been one himself? No, he couldn't really. But, I mean, my dad grew up, I mean, he fought in Korea and, mm. you know, was in the army for a while. And uh, my granddad on his side was a regimental sergeant major. So, you know, I think and my dad never talked about career or anything like that. Never spoke mm. about his time in the services whatsoever. But loved his time. Uh, he was a man's man. He you know, he liked a pint, liked a cigarette, liked a game of golf and liked his sport. Yeah, yeah. Like we say, Derbyshire lad, uh, presumably schooling in Derbyshire. And yet your well, first team... Actually. Sorry? Staffordshire, actually. I went to oh, Burton in grammar school. Oh, right, right. Well, rugby. in the Staffordshire, I mean, your first club, even as a youth career, was Ipswich Town. Yeah, Um I played for Repton Casuals uh, as a kid growing up on a Sunday. I say mm. I went to grammar school, so I played rugby on a Saturday. I played football on the <laughs> Sunday for the village team. And I played for the senior side in the Derby District local cup final mm. one year. And somebody got word back to Bobby Robson's brother that uh, Tom, I think his name was, who lived in the area. And so there's this young lad playing for the senior side um, in the Derby District final, worth a look. And we won the game. Um, and then I got an invite down to have a trial with Ipswich Town. And in those days, what Sir Bobby Robson realised was that they didn't have the money to go and buy players at Ipswich. I think he only, I think he only bought something like 11 or 15 players in about in all the time that he was there. Mm. So Bobby realised he needed to invest in the youth system. So to get good players, you needed to have a good scouting system. And Ron Gray with his, was his main scout uh, up in the northeast and northwest. And they used to bring down coach loads of kids every school holiday. You know, and I joined them for some games, sort of trial games. Lucky that they went well for me. And then I got invited to play for the youth team on a couple of occasions. And that was while I was still at school. Wow. And, I mean, we, we, we briefly spoke about Bobby Robson before we came in. Like, like I said, then one of the few managers, I think, who is, um, 
liked by more than sort of just <laughs> clubs that he's managed. Uh, yeah. I mean, he, 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 that was because I, 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 I still I don't think of Leicester ever as being a big club, even after sort of recent years. And it was like Ipswich then to, to, to go and what Bobby Robson did with Ipswich was almost, if not better, than what you know, uh, what, you know, has happened with Leicester. Well, I think what happened with Sir Bobby, we we sort of had an identity on the pitch of how we played the game of football. Mm. And I think through that, through the early 70s to the early 80s, then we became the favourite second team for a yeah. lot of people. Mm. So as I travelled all over Europe, all over the world, people would say, Oh, yes, I remember your side, even though I'm a Liverpool supporter. I can name you yeah. your side from 1978 or 1976 or 1981, mm -hmm. um, which is a lot easier than trying to do it these days, by the <laughs> way. But we well, ended up being sort of a, a lot of people's favourite second team because mm. of the style of football that we played and the leadership under Sir Bobby. I mean, there were there were great years. He was obviously the manager when you when you were there. I mean, I'm just looking there, um, seventy nine. It, it was like fourteen years or some fourteen seasons as manager. I mean, once you yeah. get past Fergie and Arsene Wenger, no manager does that these days. No, not at all. You and know, he weathered a storm there early on because I think he had a bit of a rough start, and yeah. I think the, the the chairman, Mr. John Cobbold, called him into the the office one day and I think Sir Bobby thought his days were numbered then and uh, came out with a new five-day contract. <laughs> that's what the Again, something else you wouldn't see these days, <laughs> oh, no. unfortunately. Um, nearly 300 games for you at uh, Ipswich, 17 goals, which is not bad for a centre-back. Um, I mean, what was Bobby Robson like to, 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 to manage? Um because I say on the outside, and again we touched on this, but on the outside he always seemed such a gentle giant. You know, he like I say when we lost that that semi final to Germany, you know, the click of his fingers, the shrug of his arm. Um, but what, what was he sort of? I mean, he'd learnt his trade, hadn't he as well? Yeah, he learned his trade, and he was very tight with the FA. Um, but what he was. Um, from the football point of view, he kept the game very simple. Mm. And he tried to mould a, a team where all the players fitted closely together and fitted well together. So he talked about it being like a jigsaw, where each piece fitted neatly with the next piece yeah. alongside. So the two centre-halves formed a, a close relationship and knitted well. Your midfield players all knitted well. Your defence worked well with your, your midfield and your wide players or your front players all bonded well together. So you've got this tight, well-knitted team of players there. And it was a case of, one, we were extremely fit. We worked very hard on fitness. We worked exceptionally hard on the basics of the game, being able to pass the ball and control the ball exceptionally well. And being very fit, I think that gave us an edge on a lot of teams that even if we weren't playing particularly well, we had good basics to fall back on. Yeah. You know, nobody was going to outwork us. Nobody was going to outpass us. Um, technically, we might have not had the most skillful players in the world, but we were very good at what we could do. And so Bobby kept the game very simple. You know, give it to somebody in the same colour shirt as you and let's get on from there. But um, and we had we didn't have any interference from above. And I've, I've got to tell you a quick story about our chairman, John Cobbold. Uh, he came to watch us play at Leicester one day, and Leicester City beat Ipswich 3 0. And the chairman, John Cobbold, um, old Etonian, um, they used to own a brewery, so they used to like a glass of champagne or two. Yeah, John Cobbold came in after the game into the boardroom at Leicester. Saw Sir Bobby there, went up to Bobby and said, Bobby, he said, I thought our lads were absolutely fantastic today, especially in the second half. They were absolutely superb, great performance. And Sir Bobby said, Mr. John, 
we played in yellow today, not blue and white. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> Mr. Young just stood there. He said, well, you wouldn't expect a chairman like me to know that, would you? <laughs> fair, fair, oh, point. fair point. Oh, I love that. Absolutely love it. Um, you never quite won the league. Though. I think you came second one, one season, didn't you? Yeah, 1981, um, mm. Aston Villa won the, the title that year. We beat them three times that season. Uh, we won the UEFA Cup and we got knocked out of the FA Cup at the semi-final stage at Villa, Villa Park, of all places, um, yeah. by Manchester City, a full power. Um, extra time, free kick. Um, it still bugs us a little bit, but uh, see, we... We played 66 competitive games that year. Mm. And I I played every minute of every game. Aston Villa played, I think it was something like 48 games that year and only used 14 players. Mm. I think they had eight players played every game that year for them. And we just, we just ran out of steam by the end of the season. You know, we lost one or two league games on the bounce. Uh, in the running, and that's uh, how Aston Villa pipped us, you know, and fair play to them for, for what they yeah. did. But you went on to win the UEFA Cup. I mean, yeah. what a great run you had in that that that, that, that season. Yeah, we played, uh, we played some difficult fixtures, you know, but we were very good at home, um, and then we managed to keep things pretty tight away from home when we needed to. We won away from home in Cologne, we beat St. Etienne four one away from home on an yeah. absolutely diabolical pitch. <laughs> and then um the two legged final against St. Etienne, we got a, a very good lead in the in the first leg of the game. Um and then it's a little bit tighter than we would have hoped for the second leg, but you know, we managed to scrape through. I'm just looking here. I mean, in the third round over because everything was obviously two legged the good old days before you had all these groups and everything like that yeah. but i mean uh just find you in in the, you, you just got past prague sort of three two on aggregate so yeah that one was a bit yeah. tight <laughs> to be honest with you then in the third round um you beat um oh god here we go uh, <laughs> I'm useless. I'm useless with yeah. the, anything outside of England. You beat the them second, five one. Yeah, and the second leg there mm. um, out in Poland, we were. Uh, I think there was about six inches of snow on the pitch before the game, right. and the problem was that the fixture list was that tight. And UEFA was saying, "Well, listen, you know, if we call the game off now, we've got to reschedule it." You don't really want it rescheduled. We have the option where we can sort of scrape the excess snow off the pitch. And if you watch it on YouTube or any platform like that, you'll see that the pitch is actually white <laughs> with, with red markings on it, red oh, lines. Yeah. So they did all the lines in red. There's a, a bank of snow about two yards off each side of the, the pitch and behind the goals. And we basically just played on top of the snow just to get the game out of the way. But like you say, we had a good lead from the first leg. I was going to say, really, unless you'd, you had a huge collapse, five nil from the first leg, you were through, yeah. really, weren't you? Yeah. But it was freezing. It was it was something like about minus ten when we played. Um, I remember we had a, a big liter bottle of Johnny Walker Scotch in the changing room. That uh, so Bobby insisted everybody had a swig out of the bottle before we went on to the pitch. You know, we've been out for a warm-up, came back in. He said, listen, everybody have a mouthful of this before you go out because that cold air is really going to hit you just before the game. So uh, I think Kevin Beattie got hold of the bottle later and there wasn't a lot left. <laughs> I was going to say, how many of you went out there drunk? And again, though, it didn't matter at 5-0 up. Um, and then, as you mentioned, I mean, quarter-final, St Etienne, first leg away. 4-1 up. And again, you must be thinking at that point, our name's on the cup. Well, we were we were playing well at the time. Um, mm. But we were starting to pick up one or two little injuries along the way. Uh, we'd lost George Burley, who got injured um, around about 
January, February time, I think. Uh, mm. So we we, uh, we lost George Burley um, with a cruciate knee injury. So he was out for the season there. Um, and we were we were playing we were playing some some good football, and we had a a, a closeness of the group. I mean, even before the St. Etienne game, mm. we were given a bit of free time on the Tuesday lunchtime to to wander around the town centre and see a few of the sites. And I think most of the lads sat in the bar and had a few pints and a couple of games of and darts. The team developing here, isn't there, with, with the switch at that time? Well, were, in those days, that's how the game was. Yeah, you know, we saw the players' lounge. And yeah. One of the, the best examples I saw in a, in a players' lounge was your your own Steve Walsh when I played alongside oh. Walshy, who I think is a brilliant fella. Yeah, lovely, lovely guy. guy. Lovely guy. He played against Billy Whitehurst one day at Filbert Street, the old Filbert Street, mm. and they smashed seven bells out of each other. They got splits <laughs> over the eye. I think somebody got a tooth knocked out, bent nose, yeah. cut on the face. And as soon as the final whistle went, they were hugging each other, walking off down the tunnel mm. with their arms around each yeah. other, thinking, great, we we'll see you again in a few weeks, Bill. Oh, get showered quickly and I'll see you in the bar. We'll have a few pints before you get on the coast to go home. And when I got in there, they were on about the fourth pint, just <laughs> laughing and joking. They'd been, you know, stitched up and yeah. matched up and everything. But, but that's how it should be, isn't it? That's how the game was in those yeah. days. There was yeah. that drinking culture and, yeah. yeah. I don't think it would be down too well today. I can, I can remember uh, Steve Linex again telling us, you know, when, when Mark Wallington, the goalkeeper, used to listen to the team talk before the match, sat on the bog, door open, having a fag. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. was, that was what it was like in the day. And yes, you could knock seven bells out of each other in uh, on the pitch. But then, like you say, it didn't carry on. There was, uh, occasionally it was off the field, yeah, but nine times out of ten it was, like you say, come and have a drink and what have you. And Steve Walsh is such a quiet guy when you speak to him. Yeah. <laughs> but he pulls that shirt on and wow. <laughs> like... We had we had Walshy, Ali Mocklin, who's oh, great. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, and Ali came down with uh, Guy McAllister in sort of 81 as well, when, uh, 85 when, when I first came along. Um, Tony Seeley. You know, we're talking yeah. about lads with a lot of character. John O'Neill, centre half, brilliant, mm. brighty up front, sort of Lineker's replacement, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, great squad of players that would stick together both on and off the pitch. Yeah. You got to the de final. Um, what I mean, it, you, AZ out, Mark. I mean, it was a tight one again. You won the first leg three nil. Uh, yeah. You lost the second leg 4-2, but 5-4 on aggregate, that's all that matters. That must have been a one amazing feeling, because that was then, of course, no Champions League. So before Champions yeah. League, it was the you know main competition in Europe, and you were champions of Europe. Yeah, it's fantastic. I think we were chosen as Adidas European Team of the Year that year as well. But in the, in the second leg, and it was strange, you know, we... We led from the first leg 3 0, as you quite rightly said, Chris. Yeah. And we thought, well, if we can keep things tight for the first 10, 15 minutes of the game, great, fantastic. We actually scored about 10 minutes into the game to make it 4 0. Mm. And all of a sudden, AZ Outmar, they got nothing to lose now. They absolutely yeah, yeah. chucked the kitchen sink at us. Johnny Matthod, who ended up playing up at Forest up the road as well. Yes, yeah. Spell boss, uh, Keys Kiss. They got some decent players in the side and they just threw everything at us. And they had what well, I've got, you know, one or two lucky breaks uh, that led to a couple of goals. And all of a sudden, yeah. it was a bit of a hang on job towards the end. But, you know, we got another goal. So it all got sorted out. I mean, looking at that side, I mean, it was Paul Cooper in goal, who as well late yeah. in his career ended up at Leicester. Uh, Mick Mills, England yeah. captain, future England captain. Oh, Frank Tyson, one of the first, sorry, I can never say, I'm useless with names. Frank one of the Tyson. first, yeah, one of the first, and a great player, majestic on the ball, but one of the first, what we call foreign players that was in the game, I believe. 
Russell yeah. Osman, well, that's yourself, isn't it? Yeah. Russell Osman, yeah. Terry Butcher, John Walk, another one, Arnold Muran, and he was another great player, wasn't he? Yeah. Paul Mariner, Alan, I mean, Brazil. They, when you look back, I don't think, as I, said, I think it's a team that you look back on and think, wow, probably more so than you did at the time. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of us think that the side really should have maybe won a little bit more than we actually did. But, mm. you know, we got a few injuries. Like I said, George Burley got a, a serious knee injury that, that season. Um, at the end of the 81 season, the following year, we weren't, we weren't great. And then, so Bobby left to, to join uh, the FA and take over as mm. England manager. And the club had sort of overstretched itself a little bit, you know, to build a new stand. So money was a little bit tight. I think that yeah. as a European ban, that, that came into force yeah, as well. So we yeah. weren't getting the, the, the revenue in that we needed. And suddenly one or two of the players had to be sold and the players got, you know, there was no improvement in contracts, you know, and and it was the same. Suddenly it was my my turn to uh, to move on and that was 85 and that's basically why I came up to Leicester. I'm going to say, what I'm, it must have been a wrench to leave um, uh, Ipswich after all, all that time. Was it, did you have choices or was it just Leicester that had come in for you? Um, how it happened, it was it was a bit of a disappointing way to leave the club, really, because I was asked to go and have a chat about my contract with Bobby Ferguson, who was uh, yeah. the old reserve team coach, first team coach who took over from Bobby Robson. And he just said, listen, you know, we've got no money. Um, try and find yourself a club and we'll sort a deal out and... Uh, and that's it, really. Mm. So, uh, and from that point on to the end of the season, which was about another three months, you know, he made it a little bit uncomfortable for me. And it was a case of trying to go sort something out as soon as I could. Um, Gordon Milne and Leicester City made contact, and I thought, well, you know, that's uh, a nice club, similar sort of size and... Mm. Uh, same sort of characteristics as um, Ipswich Town. Um, and, you know, when I first went up to Leicester, you know, I enjoyed it. Met Gordon Milne, um, had a nice chat with him. I know from playing against Leicester City, what a, what a great crowd that they got up there. Um, so really, I didn't... I didn't think too much about it. You know, it was, it was a nice deal and I know I had to go somewhere. So I just wanted to get things done as quickly as I could. And it was strange because it wasn't the best of times, unfortunately, at Leicester for those seasons. No. Um, and Gordon Milne, like you say, was was uh, was manager. Who, who, you know, he moved up, obviously, uh, after a while. But uh, yeah, I, yeah. Think he, I don't think he ever had sort of a, a fair crack of the whip. Uh, but he came in and we, <laughs> that season, that first season, sort of 85, 86, we finished 19th and just stayed up because it was two down at the time. Unfortunately, at the expense of Ipswich Town. Yeah, well, funny old story that, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it, by one point as well, you know, it couldn't have been any closer. Um, and then the following season, we did go down, unfortunately. Uh, David, were you there when David Pleat came in? Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, really. Not not one of the most popular managers there's ever been <laughs> at Leicester. Uh, what was he like to play under? I quite uh, enjoyed my time with uh, with David. Um, in between David Pleat and Gordon Milne was Brian Hamilton, who's ex Ipswich player. Um, that I'd known anyway, and I still see Brian now. And Brian was responsible for Steve Walsh coming down from Wigan. Mm. Um, but David Pleat, he had a good um, I think he had a good understanding with players. If he could, if he could understand the players, you could get on with him. And he gave players the um, the authority to 
do what needed to be done on the pitch. You know, I remember speaking to some managers saying, listen, we need to either, you know, compress things and keep closer to the halfway line and push up a little bit. And they said, no, you know, and, and they would go against what I thought needed to be done. Whereas Pleaty would say, listen, if, if you want to hold a high back line and you think you can cope with it, you're the lads on the pitch, you know what's going on. Or yeah. if you feel you can drop off to counteract them trying to get in behind you, you do that. But you take responsibility for it and make sure it works. Yes. You know, yeah. So from that point of view, he was very understanding, you know, and he's an he is an encyclopedia of football, David Pleat, and players, yes. and always very interesting to talk to. He's always, I mean, when he does a co commentary, uh, he always knew his stuff. You know, oh, yeah. he was never going oh, yeah. to get caught yeah. out. Um, during that time, of course, you played with Steve Linex. Now, Steve Linex is, is a regular on the show. He's just texted me now because uh, he does the prediction show with us and he's not doing very well, but uh, he's in left uh, back, wasn't he? Uh, winger, right winger. Although if he was in goal the whole game, if you remember, <laughs> yeah. he used to come along every, every morning in a car and they used to car share Steve Linex. Right. Alan Smith, Bob Hazel. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah, they used to come over from, yeah. Say no more. Say no more. No, there's a three threesome. Um, but were, were you part of the game? Because obviously he's gone down in folklore for two games. One, which I don't think you were, which was the cup, the cup game against Shrewsbury. But the game, I think it was against Southampton when it was called off because it was raining and he was swimming across the pitch. I don't know I if you were there for that one. Because uh, I know you went well, obviously on to play for Southampton. Yeah, I played a few times at Southampton where mm. it probably shouldn't have been a, a lot of carry. It, was it... When did Matt Letizia make his debut? Because I think he, he scored a hat-trick on his debut against us one year. Now, I was either playing for Leicester or for Ipswich. He might have even been playing for Leicester, I think. Um... Let's have a look. Uh, what would we do without without Wikipedia, eh? Mm. Um, <laughs> he made his club debut. Oh, no. Um, Matt Letizia made his club debut in a 4-3 defeat at Norwich. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, by, by the end of the season, he scored six goals in 24 league games, including a hat trick against Leicester City in the league. Uh, that was... Um, uh, he signed professional forms in eighty six. So that I'm guessing it would be 86, 87 yeah. season. Well, the pitch that day mm. was absolutely diabolical. Freezing cold, puddles on the pitch, um, all sorts of stuff. And Matt Letizia was scooting past people. One of the finest players I've ever played with. Yeah. You know, balance, technique. And if you look at his, his video of his best 100 goals... Like there's long range efforts, there's headers, oh, there's side yeah. foots, there's chips, there's benders, there's left foot, there's right foot. Wonderful player, great player. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't think he played for England enough, did he? No, I, what if he played once, didn't he? Yeah, he was a great. culture in those days, and some would say it still is, where you only get into the England team if you play for certain teams. Yeah, but, but Glenn Hoddle got left out of the England side on numerous occasions because people didn't yeah. feel that he worked hard enough off the ball. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then when Glenn Hoddle becomes manager, he doesn't pick Matt Letizia <laughs> for the same reason, which I thought was just hypocritical. Yeah, you can't, you can't work it out. But um, you... you I mean, you scored. Um, let me just have a look. You scored eight goals in 108 games for Leicester. Uh, yeah. So you you contributed on that. Was was it good times? Would you say you, you have happy memories of Leicester? I had a great time at Leicester. I had three fantastic years. I ended yeah. up living out in Hallerton. Um Used to see a bit of uh, Robbie James when the late Robbie James was yeah. there. He was living at Kibworth, so we used to come in there together. I know Ali Mocklin's still out that way now. Mm. Uh, Still speak to Guy McAllister. I, Ian Andrews, I thought was a wonderful goalkeeper in those yeah, days. Yeah. And um, we had a great side, great team. Mm. Like I mentioned, John O'Neill early on, um, 
Bobby Smith, Ian Wilson, Andy Feely. Yeah, great fun. Do you remember Paul Reed? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, down in Wales now, I believe. Um, a yeah, nice, quiet, calm lad, wasn't he? He was. <laughs> he, again, he is now off the pitch, you yeah. know. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, Ian Andrew they always had good goalkeepers at Leicester. That was, you know, that was one, you know, thing about Leicester. Yeah, uh, and obviously, good. Alan Smith was there, and then he was sold to Arsenal, and he came back. Uh, you were, you went to to join Southampton. Yeah, on the south coast again. Um, what, why was the move there? Well, I went. I'd done three years at, at Leicester, which was the yeah. the length of my initial contract, mm -hmm. and I spoke to David Pleat and I basically said, "Listen, you know, if you make me a uh, a reasonable offer, I'm more than happy to to stay longer." Um, yeah. And he came back with an offer, which I didn't think was uh, beneficial enough. Um, so I said, well, I would hope that you'd be able to improve that that offer. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, no, that's, that's the only offer that's going to be on the table. I said, well, uh, I'm out of contract. Um, I know Southampton are interested. I'll go there. And Southampton were in the... The first division of the Premier League, as it's called now. Yeah. And David said, well, let me speak to the chairman. I said, well, I'm going down this afternoon. So I got in my car and I spoke to David halfway down. And he said there was he couldn't get hold of the chairman. Uh, I said, right, well, I'm going to carry on down into Hampshire. Uh, they offered me a, a good deal. And it wasn't about the money. It was more about playing back in the first division again. Yes. Um, so off I popped down there and had three and a bit, two or years playing for, for the club in Hampshire. I mean, you 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 couldn't risk not signing because it, it was, you, you hadn't got a team, like you say, at the time. And you, you've obviously got, you know, family and you, yeah. you've got your career to think of. Um, and you couldn't really wait around for Leicester, could you? No, I couldn't. You, you know, and I was, I was very... Honest with David, uh, David Pleat, and I said, if you can speak to the chairman and see if there's a little bit more money available, then I'm more than prepared to, to consider it. Because my my oldest son had been born in Leicester. Um, we'd had a great, a fantastic three years, uh, hanging about with people like Alan Birch and all and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Frank yeah. Worthington, did you did you know Frank Worthington? Yeah, I knew Frank. I knew oh, Frank. He, was, he was a character as well. <laughs> you know, so I had a great time at Leicester. Yeah. You know, really, really did enjoy it. You know, and we had uh, we had some good times there. Not as good as they've had since, but you know, I enjoyed my three years there. But when you look at, I was twenty five, twenty eight by that time, I think. Yeah. Um, 28, 29, so I'd still felt I'd got three or four good years left in me that I could possibly uh, cope with first division rather than second division football. And I took the chance with Southampton and, yeah, and they had three more years in the first division. Now, it would be a miss of me and I would, and a gentleman called Anthony would never speak to me again if I didn't mention Bristol City, because he's yeah. a Bristol City, uh, well, he's born and bred. Um, like, he likes his cider. Uh, he goes down to the Wurzel yeah. Stadium or whatever it's called now for Bristol City. Ex Leicester manager there, and he's he, he's come straight in, and he's also an Arsenal fan. But you know, the typical Arsenal fans, they can't just have one team, can they? Uh, but he says, big up Chris Russell, what was uh, life like at Bristol City and who was your favourite signing? Right. Life in Bristol was very, very good. I had 30 years living in Bristol because oh. I moved over there in 91 after I left um, Southampton. Okay. Southampton yeah. had a change of manager and we had some fella called Grand Foot come in there. Um, and 
Leicester City, they, they were just getting over the fact that they had these, you know, lads on 10-year contracts and stuff like that that really sort of mm. bank up the club and they'd, you know, reinvented themselves again uh, with some of the lads tearing the contracts up. And, and watching how Bristol City has grown over that period of time um, was good. Mm. Around about this time of year in 94... Um, I went from being a player to player manager to more or less manager. We knocked Liverpool out of the uh, the FA Cup at Anfield, which was a, a fantastic night. Graham Souness was in charge of Liverpool then, and they got in Ian Rush playing, Steve McManaman, John Barnes, Neil Ruddock. Um, so that was a, a massive game, and when uh, when you talk about who was my favourite signings. I think a lot of people would expect me to say Brian Tinian because he scored that goal at uh, Anfield that night, which was a, mm-hmm. a lovely left foot bender. He was a good lad that we got down from um, uh, from Bradford, uh, Geordie boy. Um, I didn't really get a chance to spend much money at Bristol City, and then they ended up getting the getting the sack, and then you. You're on the old merry-go-round again, but you know I, I love. It goes with the position, doesn't it? That's the thing. Yeah, that's it. it it's, it's one thing that you know for sure. If you take on a job as a football manager, yeah. you're going to get a sack. It's not a case of you know how long is it? You know, you're signing the contract for. It's just how long am I just going to be here for? I, yeah. I, it would be remiss of me because Anton is in. Not to mention, of course, you did also have a little bit of a caretaker role at um, the bigger team in Bristol, of course, Bristol Rovers. <laughs> <laughs> Up the gas. Hi, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a funny situation because um, I'd been out the game for a little while. I was still doing work, media work for, for Eurosport and, and such like. Mm. And the manager had left the club. Um, the caretaker manager suddenly thought we're a little bit close to the bottom of the table. I think there's about yeah. six games left and he didn't want to be responsible for being held responsible for taking the team down because yeah. it was bottom of the fourth division then and they would have been gone out of league football. And I phoned the chairman up and I just said, uh, listen, I'm not doing anything at the moment. If you need a manager, let me do it. Don't mm-hmm. pay me. Um, if I keep you up, then give me a bonus and that's the way we'll do it. Yeah. And he said, are you sure? I said, well, why not? You know, um, I don't think you've got anything to lose. Uh, I said, I guarantee you I'll, I'll keep you up. And I remember going in for the first game, walking behind the Blackthorn stand, the Blackthorn cider stand. Yeah. And one of the big rough supporters coming rushing out of the bar, sort of, ranting and raging at me saying we don't need you well the yeah. gas heads if you're yeah, a yeah. place that it's like you know we don't yeah. need you people here taking on this club we don't need you taking on the job and i was walking in with a referee i looked behind me the referee had disappeared the linesman had disappeared they'd all sort of scattered so <laughs> i'm having this confrontation with this supporter and i said hold on a minute listen I'm just here to try and keep you in league football. All right. Mm-hmm. Just let me get on with my job and I promise you we will still be in the league at the end of the season. And the fellow said, well, it seemed to calm down a little bit. He said, OK, if you do that, I'll buy you a pint at the end of the season. <laughs> so I said, OK, fine. And went yeah. on my merry way. After the last game of the season in the hospitality lounge, a bloke in a suit, shirt and tie came up to me. He said, you might not recognise me, but I was the bloke that jumped all over you the first game that you turned up as our caretaker manager. Mm. There's the pint I owe you. And as good as his word, fantastic. Well, we can't say fairer than that, can you? Not, you can't say say so I've, I've got a soft spot for the gas as well. Yes, yeah. Do you miss managing? I miss the day-to-day, day-to-day involvement with, with players, whether you're, mm-hmm. you're playing with players, whether you're coaching players, or whether you're managing. It's, mm-hmm. I think it's something that's always in your blood. 
Um, I think I would probably struggle a bit these days because it's such a scientific yeah. mm-hmm. game. I worked in um, Ipswich Academy back in 2011 to 2013, looking after the under-18s then. And it was just as the E Triple P was uh, being introduced, and you had to have so many sports scientists and yeah, yeah. Uh, strength and conditioning coach and extra physios, and mm. and everybody was wanting a piece of the action with the players all the time. And the one thing I was always fighting against was having time with the players, actually playing football. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the, the sports science people are saying, "Well, you've done." so many hours on the pitch today and you had a a long day yesterday and you said, hold on, it wasn't a long day. You know, they're saying, well, you know, on our monitors, it's saying the players have worked this hard and that hard. You know, and you suddenly, and the game's changed a bit now and that's why you see there's so many substitution and players coming on and off and five subs and... uh. It is, it's a completely... Utterly different game, like what we said earlier. Yeah. But uh, you also 11 times for England. And yes. that was under uh, Ron Greenwood. Ron Greenwood and Sir Bobby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to be my next question. Did you did Sir Bobby pick you when he became manager after Ron Greenwood? Well, Sir Bobby was in charge of uh, the England side for my first game which was out in Australia, and it was like a centenary game. Um, and it was like a B international. So Ron Greenwood wasn't in charge of the team. So Bobby was as the B team manager, yeah. but it was classified as a full cap. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I missed out on, was it the 82 World Cup? Um, Ron Green would have left me out of the squad, and then I got left out of the, the squad in '86 as well, um, or '84. Uh, you know, and it was a bit of a, a funny time with the the England team. You know, we were, you could say, a bit of a transitional period. You know, the end of Kevin Keegan's yeah. uh, role, really. Um, Trevor Brooking, people like that were coming to the end of the career. And it, you know, we just weren't playing very well. Norway beat us one year, you know, Maggie Thatcher, we beat your boys, all that palaver. Oh, yeah, don't remind me. <laughs> uh, it wasn't so it wasn't a very a very good time to be in the England squad or trying to establish yourself in the England squad. And my last game was uh, against Denmark at uh, at Wembley and I thought I played pretty well. So Bobby told me he thought I played my best have a game for England and um, after that I never got picked again. <laughs> now that sounds like a sort of thing that Brendan Rodgers does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> He's well, a player then you never see him again. It does happen. <laughs> uh, and then of course you you almost had a second career in acting. I mean, you know, I remember the um, Escape to Victory and I remember the, the original, not the new one that's absolutely, absolutely rubbish. How the hell did that come around? You must have, it must have been, it must have been a great, uh, great time for you. Well, see, that was back in 1980, 81. Mm. So we were quite... Um, Quite a good team then. I think we've been runners up in the league a couple of times or whatever. And so Bobby was um, sort of quite approachable, I think. Uh, and somebody either liked the way we played or liked what was going on at Ipswich. And they came to him with a proposal saying that they needed some proper footballers to do some footballing scenes in the background for the prison of war film. Mm. So Sir Bobby called uh, a players meeting one day in the changing room, explained that this film crew were looking for a few players to make up a squad of uh, so background footballers for this prisoner of war film that was going to be set in Hungary um, it would mean five weeks in Budapest during the summer. 
you get paid for it. I was single at the time, so my, people like myself, Johnny Walk, Kevin Beatty, yeah, Robin Turner, Lloyd Civil, Paul Cooper went out to, to help um, teach Stallone how to be a goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. Didn't go down very well. <laughs> <laughs> that was brave of him. <laughs> yeah, it was. Um, but we, it was only when we got there that we realised that, you know, people like Pele and our dealers, Bobby Moore, like three World Cup winners yeah. were there. And it wasn't just the case that they were there for the weekend or for a week. We were there five weeks with them, mm. you know, in the same hotel, going to the same restaurants. You know, eating together, partying together, playing together, you know, day in, day out for a period of five weeks. And, yeah. and of course, Pally would come along and his manager would bring a guitar along as well and he'd play a few little tunes, a little sing song, have a little drop of scotch, you know, and we'd have another good night out. And people like Bobby Moore, Mike Summerby, uh Casimir Dana, who's Man, Man City as well, the late Casimir yeah. Dana, the late Bobby Moore. And it, it was just a shame the other week when, when Pele died that, that Bobby Moore wasn't still around to be able to tell everybody what a great person Pele was. Oh, yeah. I because thought... as well as everybody else saying, you know, if it could have come from Bobby Moore, it would have. If I, if I had to pick one picture outside of Leicester when it yeah. comes to football, it's that, you know, Brazil beat us in the 1970 World Cup in the group stage, 1-0. Yeah. And it was, the, it was the battle of the two titans. And at the end, you could see that mutual respect that they had for each other with that handshake yeah. and the chat. And it, I would never forget that picture. No, it's wonderful, isn't it? They've, they've yeah. both got the shirts off, swapping yeah. shirts. So Bobby used to say to me, he said, uh, he said, Russell, he said, did you ever see Bobby Moore play? And I said, yeah, I played against him and played with him. He said, yeah. did you ever see Bobby Moore sweat when he was playing? Mm. I'm thinking, apart from that game in 1970, I guess. <laughs> I said, no, usually no. Mm. Just stands at the back and yeah. And so Bobby said to me, he said, he doesn't sweat because he's always in the right place at the right time and he intercepts passes rather than making last-ditch tackles. Yeah. And he said to me, he said, that's how you should play. You should think about your game more, think about your positional sense more, read situations more. Mm. He, said, but, he said, your problem is you like the physical contact with people. You like to make tackles. You like to make challenges. You like to make last-ditch tackles. Yeah. And I remember the following week, with that in mind, we went and played at Manchester City at the old main road. And I think we won 2-0, maybe 3-1 or something like that for, for Ipswich. And so Bobby was waiting for me as I came off the pitch to go down the tunnel. And he said, Russell, he said, that is the way to play centre-half today. No. And Chris, I honestly hadn't broken sweat. I think I touched <laughs> the ball about four times in the whole game. And I said to him, I said, well, you, you've got to be joking. I've not done anything. He said, well, you haven't had to. You've always been in the right place at the yeah. right time. You've anticipated yeah. things rather than make last-ditch tackles. You've dropped off. You've stepped in front. You've played with your brains today. Mm. And I looked at him and I thought... Yeah, he's got a point. But it was the most boring game I've ever played in my life. <laughs> you were itching to get your foot in, weren't you? you know. yeah. Yeah. I've got to ask, who was the better footballer, Pelle or Michael Caine? <laughs> uh, the better footballer. <laughs> I, I think Pelle just nicked it. Did he? Uh, yeah. 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 Anthony says here as well, uh, is it true that Pele broke Sylvester Stallone's finger when taking shots past him before filming? Whether it broke it or not, it definitely did some damage to it. Yes. yes. Yeah. You know, but Stallone was trying to grab the ball like that. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. he had an arm wrestle with Kevin Beattie one day because 
Stallone thought he was the big muscle man, and mm. so he did a, a one-on-one arm wrestle with uh, Kevin Beat, right hand against right hand, and Kevin Beat he took him down eventually, and much to the annoyance of Sylvester Stallone. So I Stallone said, that. "Okay, we'll go left-handed now." He didn't realise that Beat is left-handed. <laughs> 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 he lost 2 0 then, shall we say? Yeah, we didn't yeah. see him much after that. No, no. Um, not not that he was anything like a, a typical American. You can't we shouldn't stereotype him, but no. uh, you know. The last Michael question fantastic though. Yeah, oh I can imagine. Yeah. I mean that that must have, like I can say you've got your football career, but then to go and do something like that. And then meet the players, like you say, like Pele that were there. O- Ozzy Ardilis was there as well, wasn't he? Yeah. You know, yeah, great. Um, great player. Great. Last question, I just want to ask you then. Um, and Anthony, I'm not saying he's going to start stalking you at all, but he's saying, what does Russell do now? Oh, crikey! I've been doing all sorts of things since uh, I finished coaching. I did mm. twenty odd years work for Eurosport. Um, mm. Uh, doing commentary and pundit work, BBC, Sky, um, until a couple of years ago, since 2013, I was working in India every year um, yes. for a company called Star Sports. Uh, yeah. That was covering the Indian Super League when that first started in 2013 and still yeah. going strong now and getting bigger and stronger all the time. So that was good. Mm. Uh, I still do some after the dinner speaking now and guest appearances and thoroughly enjoy myself as I get into my me, me older age. My wife has a successful interior design business that uh, I keep cracking the whip behind her, making sure she keeps <laughs> doing that. Yeah, um, I'm sure she'd say the same if she was on yeah. camera about you. <laughs> yeah. I try and keep busy. I go down and watch uh, Ipswich every home game and keep an eye on, yeah. on them. and. Yeah, it's it's good. They've just got to make sure they get promotion this year. That's all. Yeah, I'm lucky to go out to Burnley in in the cup early yeah. in the week. Um, I've got. To, I did say that was the last question. I do apologise. Just one more. Again, it would be remiss of me not to ask uh, ask this. The Premier League winning season for Leicester. I mean, yeah. that came out of nowhere. And you quite rightly said, you know, that Ipswich team under Bobby Robson was everybody's favourite second team at that time. And I think for one season, that was Leicester. And I yeah. don't think, if you're outside of North London, sorry, Anthony, I know that you're in the chat, but you came second, OK? Arsenal came second. Um, but outside of North London, I think everybody just wanted us to, to win it. I mean, how yeah. surprised were you, like the rest of us, that, that we, you know, we pulled it off? <sighs> It just proved that by a little bit of application, togetherness, a little bit of understanding and bags of hard work and honesty, you can you can make it happen. Yes. You really can make it happen. But you have to have honesty from your players. They have to be prepared to put a shift in, mm. day in, day out whether it's on the training ground, whether it's on the on the match pitch um, during the, the important 90 minutes. And for that particular period of time in that season, those boys were really tight as a unit, weren't they? Oh, they, had, yeah. they had a style of play. And even though when it came around to teams playing them for the second time in the season, and they thought, well, we might get found out a little bit now, they still had the application and the desire to make it work for them. Yes, yeah. And oh, it, it just shows you what can be done. It can. And I don't often cry as a man, although I'm nothing against it, but two times were when we when we won that thing that was presented to us at Everton and Andrea yeah. Bunch- uh, Andreas Bunch- uh, Bocelli was there singing Ness and Dorm. And my God, yeah. I was... Yeah, screaming with tears and yeah. when we won the FA Cup two things I would never see thought I would see in my lifetime and two things I saw with my son and there's something about football that just gets to you sometimes and yeah. I, I don't I mean obviously I want us to do well but it was an amazing amazing uh, few seasons that we've just had but you know things move on and money is spent 
by by vast amounts yeah. by yeah, things clubs. things go around in circles though, Chris, don't they? they you do. know, nobody's ever yeah. gonna stay at the top forever. No. You know, no. Things and will I always think, change. And I think, you know, there will I think it will happen again, not for Leicester, but I think there will be a season when another club breaks through. And yeah. I would say another club, I mean Newcastle are doing it now and it's good to see but obviously they've, they've got the money and the backing to do that i'm, I'm not saying yeah. that you know leicester aren't a poor club we've got very rich owners but in comparison to the so-called big six it when you know when we're not sort of that sort of uh, time so i look forward to that happening russell you've been a gentleman sir thank you very much for coming thank on you. thank you for the invitation chris no no thank you for i always appreciate the fact that you know people you know best players give up the time to do this and really really do appreciate it and i wish you all the best to yourself and your good lady make sure thank that you. you know if she is cracking the whip that it's only uh, <laughs> it's only for the business <laughs> <laughs> but mate take care stay safe and as i say uh, thank you so very, very much. Yeah, great. Thank you, Chris. Every Thanks success to yourself. Thank you very much. Take care. Spurs as well. Oh, God, yes. We need, well, the goalkeeper's out, so that's one thing in our favour. But, you know, Harry Kane's going to score. He yeah, always but, against Leicester. He can score so long as Leicester score more than what he gets. And Well, I was just saying, he, he was celebrating scoring, was it 300-odd goals for, um, uh, for Spurs recently, but... Yeah, you know, Jamie Vardy's got a, a Premier League medal, uh, a, <laughs> a, a FA Cup medal, and the Community Shield medal. I don't think Harry yeah, Kane's yeah. got any of those. But anyway, yeah. that's me being a little yeah. bit. Uh, yeah. Get your medals on the table. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All the okay. best. Thank you, and again, thank you very much. Take, Take care. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye. -bye. <sighs> Thank you so much to Russell for coming on. We always appreciate it. These ex-players give up the time. Um, obviously, we you know they, 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 they do media work for money. We don't pay them for the money. Um, and Nate has just come in. Sorry, Anthony, I didn't get a chance to. We've gone over the hour, so I didn't get a chance to ask your last question. I'm sorry. Nate says, really enjoyed this conversation. Learn a lot about the history of the club and the sport itself. Well done, Chris. Great show. Thank you very, very much. Next Wednesday, next Wednesday, we've got another one. Um, no, we haven't. That's a lie. <laughs> oh, God. When, when, when? I don't know what I'm doing. What date are we on today? The 8th of February. So, yes, that'll teach me for turning too many pages over in my diary. Next Wednesday at the same time, Hume. Yeah, Ian Hume is going to be with us all the way from uh, Canada. Uh, <laughs> is of course, can, uh, Canadian. Had a horrendous head injury, as thankfully touch wood, and, and God bless that he's come through that. Um, and he's, he's, he's doing as the coaching career now in Canada. So, uh, and then the Wednesday after that, we have got, I've got to say, and no disrespect to everybody else that I've had on, but I have got to say that it is probably the biggest ex-player that I've ever had on the show. Um, I can't going to tell you who, because it's going to be a surprise. We're going to build up to it. But Wednesday the 22nd, it is the most... I can't, I can't believe that I've got this guy coming on. Um, He's probably grateful that he's finally said yes, because it means I'm not going to stalk him and hassle him anymore. But stay tuned for that. Ian Hume next Wednesday, and then the Wednesday after, it will be, like I say, Mr. Special Guest. Who could it be? It's certainly not this man. There we go. Certainly not him. Um, <laughs> sorry. I just laugh every time I see that. I do. But, hey, guess what? What is coming up? <laughs> Coming up next on Leicester Till I Die TV. Nine o'clock tomorrow, we have got um, the Tottenham Hotspur preview. We have got Harry coming on, not Mr. Kane. Harry C from a Tottenham fan uh, channel who will be coming on to chat with us about the game. And then I am going on their show on, um, where are we? On. Um, 7 o'clock on Friday, I'll be doing the return journey, as they say. 
And then nine o'clock Friday night, it's going to be question time, which will be after that moving to a Monday, uh, which we think will be a better night. For, as, as I said the other day, we're having to play around with the schedules. But the last Friday night question time, nine o'clock, and we will be talking FFP. After Leicester did all that they did in the summer, you know, we didn't sign players because we did not want to break FFP. And look, I'm not saying that we're perfect. We got done for it when we were in the championship. We paid a fine off. Um, but we did that, which has made this season extremely hard for us. And then Manchester City come along and go, yeah, so well, well, we've done it. And you can't find Man City because it's just like, you know, <laughs> it's money and, you know, it's money, uh, pocket change for them, isn't it? Should they be should they be relegated? We'll be talking about that Friday night at nine o'clock. But tomorrow, and of course, then we've got the watch along and post match Spurs shows on Saturday. We will though. Um, we will be playing, like I say, nine o'clock tomorrow. The Spurs preview. So join us then, um, Anthony. Thank you so very much, mate. Uh, I want to say fair play to getting these players on, mate. Appreciate it. I am abs. I I. <laughs> I don't know why I do it to myself, because before I do these shows, I'm absolutely so nervous. Oh, my God. I mean, Pontus came out the other week. I mean, I was I was pooing myself. Uh, but I am talking, and I can't believe that my little channel here, which isn't a big channel, it's not the biggest, not the best, but it's fun, hopefully, and I'm getting to talk to these players, heroes of mine, that I have seen on the pitch. You know, I can remember watching Russell play. It's just, I, I do appreciate them giving up the time. I really, really do. Having said that, for everyone that comes on, three say no. So <laughs> there we go. Uh, Anthony Kamara. <laughs> we'll have to sort him out. I don't think I can afford him, mate. Uh, I'm glad you enjoy them, Nat. Yeah, we do learn a, a, a bit about the club. And it's nice to see the players before and after. And what and, and I mean, that. Russell Osman in Escape to Victory, one of my favourite films, and I mean the original, not the, the remake when it was about American football or something, the proper one with Pelé and Russell Osman in, and, of course, that other great footballer, Michael Caine. Guys, thank you very much for watching. Anthony and Nate, thank you for all your questions in the chat. Really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you for watching. Less Little I Die TV, please sub if you're new. Smash the likes, whether you're new or not. And if you have been listening on your favourite podcast platform, thank you so very, very much. I really appreciate you listening. 42,000 plus downloads last season. We're now part of the uh, TalkSport fan network. That's just going to take us to another level. Uh, Anthony, yeah, it's a great film, isn't it? It is a great film. I am going to go. Um, <laughs> and I'll be back. I'll be back. Uh, I'm going to go, and I will be back tomorrow at 9 o'clock. I did have a new outro clip, but I haven't uploaded it, so there we go. Such is life. Such is life. And I will see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Good night. Take care. And remember, whatever you do, don't do anything I wouldn't enjoy. Good night now. This podcast is proud to be part of the TalkSport Fan Network. TalkSport. Powered by fans. Thanks for watching Lester Till I Die. This is Chris saying goodbye and see you next time. For watching these videos are tremendous you better like them too or i'll be back lester till i die tv